Today we're going to talk about the addiction of toxic relationships. This is a topic that affects more people than we're willing to admit. I really wish more people uh, focus on this. As a youth minister, it really needed to be taught more. People just didn't understand. But today, hopefully, we have a better understanding. And I want to focus on one aspect, because we can all identify what a toxic relationship is. We see a couple. It doesn't really have to be a couple by chance. It could be a business relationship. It could be a friendship. But we see two people, one of which is getting treated in a way we wonder why they're still there. Right? We've all seen it. We've all wondered why. So that's what I've been studying. Why are they still there? And there's actually a little bit of science behind it. I will tell you right now, I am not a psychiatrist. It's a little that, that a hobby of mine, but I have no formal training. So I have no degree. Please do not take this as any type of therapy. Take it for what it's worth. All you have is a young man who did a little bit of research, and now I'm just trying to tell you what I've researched, okay? Take that for what it's worth. But, and I will always say, first and foremost, no matter what, there is no excuse for bad behavior. So what I'm about to, all, what I'm about to go through is not defending or excusing anybody. Let that be known. There is no excuse. I don't care what your daddy did to you. I don't care what your mama did to you. You are accountable for your own decisions. So, that said, let's explore some reasons why people stay in toxic relationships. From birth, the brain, its primary mission is to wire itself to provide the best lifestyle possible. From birth, it is our instinct to try to position ourselves in the best way manner. To achieve this, the brain develops itself and takes cues from the early environment to determine how the world should be and wires itself accordingly to survive in that world. That's why adults who grow up in unstable environments, that's why when things are going good, they freak out and expect the bottom to fall out. Because when they were young, the bottom always fell out when things were going good. Have you seen anybody self-destruct when things are going well? This is what they know. Their brain developed at a younger age that when things go well, the bottom falls out and they're just reacting to what their brain developed to. Likewise, people growing up with parents who were very, very exceptionally loving people, but yet sometimes extremely abusive, those people believe that the, that's how the world should be. You're allowed to hurt me because you're nice to me. Because you love me sometimes, you're allowed to be mean to me other times. Y'all see the correlation? How that works out now. So that's the mindset. If you're nice to me, you're allowed to hurt me. Now how do we reconcile that fact with what I said earlier, the brain is wired to provide the highest quality of life? Because I said it's according to how the brain perceives the world should be. How the brain perceives the world should be. That's the key phrase here. Another part of why someone stays in a toxic relationship, it, it involves what's called a variable reinforcement. Um, reinforcement, and I, I don't mean to dumb it down too much where it offends anybody, but think of the the rat in the, in the cheese in the maze. So we have variable, but before I, you understand variable, I need to teach you fixed. Fixed says if you do this, you'll get this reward. If you do X, you'll get Y. Okay, so if the rat solves this problem, it gets this reward. Well, that's easy for people because the rules are laid out and clear. It's a fixed reinforcement. It's not always great relationships because somebody can learn to manipulate that. They can learn to push your buttons like a remote control. Oh, she likes flowers and chocolates. That's, that's how boys try to play the field in high school. They try to Produce this way by providing those fixed reinforcements. But they're fixed. The rules are there. On the flip side, variable, meaning random, it changes. Okay? So at any given moment, you're going to get something different. That in itself triggers.
triggers a different part of the brain. The reward center of the brain absolutely loves variable reinforcement. Why? Because it's thrilling. It's like gambling. Okay? There's that excitement. You're going to roll the dice, and you're either going to win big or lose big. It's, it's exhilarating. Welcome to the variable reinforcement of a toxic relationship. For folks who don't know better and they're raised in this environment or are not aware of it, they've gotten addicted to that part of the, the thrill. Who am I going to get today? A normal person would say, that's stupid, right? But it happens every day. It happens every day. Thousands of people every day, everywhere. And they don't know it. I bet you right now someone was watching online or someone's in here and they're in a toxic relationship. They're like, no, uh -huh. I'm just telling you what the science shows. There's that part of the brain. It's, it's called the dopamine. See, the dopamine, it, it's the, uh, the happy dance. It's what makes your brain happy. And it responds to that. Okay? And dopamine is very addictive. So once you get that one hit, your brain says, I like that. That's why people become addicted to gambling. It's not that they like the idea of possibly losing their home. It's not the idea they like the idea of losing whatever they're risking. But they like that high that they get. The person in a toxic relationship, they don't like being abused. They don't like being heartbroken. But they like they, without realizing it, their brain says, I like that high. I like that, that addiction to that dopamine. So, there is part of that addiction. Not knowing whether it's going to happen or not, it's great. We like it. The dopamine responds to lust. I need you to understand, lust does not always necessarily mean a sexual relationship. It, it can be waiting for affection. Some people could be simply waiting for validation. That's a big part. I, I talk to people all the time. All they really want is to be validated. They want to be acknowledged. I exist. I'm important to you. I matter. I serve a purpose. So again, don't, don't necessarily think we're talking about a romantic relationship. I've seen people let their bosses abuse them just so they can get the validation of being an important relationship, an important employee. There's another factor. I'm trying not to go too deep. Too, I'm trying to keep it slow. I'm closing my eyes so I can picture my words. Adrenaline. Adrenaline itself is a stimulant, and, and stimulants are addictive. We're like, yay, we like that stimulant. We like that uh, way to go. We like that that high. But in terms of neuro neurochemicals, you can think of dopamine as straight whiskey. Pardon the secular pun here. And you can think of adrenaline as beer and think of your brain as a booze hound. If given the choice, it's going to go straight for the hard stuff every time. Right? So the brain's going to choose dopamine over adrenaline every time. However, if given a chance to mix both, now we're excited. And that is where the addiction of toxic relationships comes from. Because there's the adrenaline, and then there's the dopamine. And bless God, the whole relationship is just exciting to us. The chance of a big payoff moment, the chance of a big romantic evening, the chance of, a, a, of being validated, the chance of affection... It's worth the risk in their mind. It's sad that people have to subject themselves to that. Now this does not mean that certain people with certain childhoods or certain ways of thinking that they're cursed to toxic relationships. That everyone may have these tendencies, but yet we all have a certain part of our brain that says that's stupid, I'm not going to do that no more. But that depends on another part of the brain, another chemical called serotonin. Serotonin is the chemical that affects your mood. People who are on antidepressants, that's what the antidepressant is providing, trying to provide serotonin. Because when you get low on serotonin, your mood gets low. 
And here's where our, our problem is. Because stress takes away from your serotonin. Other depressing factors takes away from your serotonin. So if you don't have enough serotonin, then you don't have the chemical to combat the request for that dopamine fix. Kind of neat when you think about the science of it all. And I'm going to tell you why this matters here in a minute. Just bear with me. It's Sunday school. Bear with me. So serotonin is not always available in someone's life. It's important that you understand these little science tidbits. Why is it important? Because it, if you understand how the dopamine affects your brain, how the serotonin affects, then you're looking at it as if it's a separate object. And you understand that it's not a real relationship. It's not a real attraction. It's kind of like moving the curtain and seeing the man behind the curtain. You're no longer deceived by the facade. And you can see it for what it really is. Oh, I'm not attracted to this abuse. I'm not attracted to this jerk. Oh, okay. And then you can find other ways of fixing yourself. Does that make sense? Someone? Anyone? I don't have glasses. I can't see you. Thank you. I got a yes. Outstanding. So, toxic relationships can be addicting for very scientific reasons. I'm going to keep going a little bit further. I've got time. Put a lot of work in it. In this. It's like, dare I say, for the sake of a, our generation who's offended by such words, it's like a slave and a master relationship. One of them is pulling the strings, and the other says, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. In said relationship, who always starts the rebellion? Who always starts the independence? It's not the master. That says, go, get! It's the slave that says, I will no longer be a slave. If you find yourself in a toxic relationship, it's going to take you saying, I will no longer be addicted. I will no longer fall for these tricks. I will make myself aware. I will learn. I will study. Do whatever I have to do to break myself of this chain, of this cycle. You have to stop chasing that big emotional payoff, especially since it only pays off randomly. It's a gambler's game. Another reason people say in toxic relationships is for the security. I know that sounds odd, but there is security in a toxic relationship, especially if they come from difficult childhoods, because they may have had toxic caregivers, and they don't know an alternative reality. If all you know is white trash parents, then chances are all you're going to appreciate is a white trash, white trash relationship. You don't know anything different. All you know is disrespect and mistreatment. So that, but so therefore, you find comfort. If you were to find, God forbid, you find yourself in a relationship with someone that respects you, you're like, ew, this is gross. What is this? Because you don't identify it. You don't trust it. You don't know what that is. I've seen people that would rather be abused because at least they know what that is. And they can relate to that. A lot of that is why people who grow up in a drug addicted household stay drug addicted because they know what that is. They can trust that. When you're in a toxic relationship and you get that partial reinforcement, it's hard to break. Because that partial reinforcement, again, it triggers that brain that, yeah, I like it. But here are some common signs that you might be in a toxic relationship. If you have difficulties making decisions, because the other person is always making it for you. If, if you have difficulty in defining and understanding your own feelings. Difficulty expressing yourself in a relationship. If you need recognition from others before your own recognition. Distrust of yourself and low self-esteem. You have difficulty setting goals. There is a lot of jealousy in the relationship. 
There is a lot of control in a relationship. You experience verbal or physical abuse. There's a willingness to please others rather than saying no, such as like a great fear or anxiety coming from saying no. Fear of rejection or obsession with recognition. Too much responsibility for the behavior of others. The unpredictability of partners' actions. Fear of doing something wrong and feelings of belittled. There was a subject that I had not heard when I was studying this, and it's called the trauma bond. Trauma bond can happen when your caregiver or partner has abused you, but still cares for you and loves you. I don't know what she's saying, but scholar's mouthing something. I hope she's not accusing someone of trauma bond. Oh, yeah, you better say it again. Trauma bond. Trauma, T-R-A-U-M-A, bond, B-O-N-D. Oh, uh, when someone has abused you, but they still care for you and love you. At least they say they do. I have a hard time accepting that premise. You know, the man beats his wife, but he still loves her. I have a hard time accepting it. But this is what's defining trauma bond. I'll tell you right now, on a side note, the man who does that or the woman who does that, they don't really love that person. They just love how that person makes them feel. It's, it's just a, it's no different than a back scratcher to them, you know. Oh, that feels good. You know, they scratch your back with it and then you throw it away until they need it again. But there's not a, a love for that person. They just love how that person makes them feel. All right. But, so when this happens... This becomes a learned attachment style. Associating love with abuse becomes a norm, something that you can relate to and recognize as customary. Therefore, it can be easy to confuse a trauma bond with actual love because it, it's so customary, so normal. Plus, you share this bond with this other person because chances are they've been through it themselves. It was a learned behavior on their part. Here are some signs you can recognize, you can see to if you're in a trauma bond. You justify their abuse by putting the blame on yourself. Ain't that sad? We've seen it. Oh, it's my fault. I shouldn't have said that. And I joke a lot. Okay, and I've got some really rough jokes. But I don't take domestic abuse lightly. Alright? That's sorry. I don't like temper tantrums. I told you before, I don't like cowards. I also don't like babies. I don't like grown men who throw temper tantrums like babies. I think that's sad, pathetic, and they need to grow up. Just, just saying. If you have an issue with your anger, grow up. Alright, so you justify their abuse by putting the blame on yourself. You forgive the abuse because you tell yourself that they love you. You want to be there for them and try to fix them. Boy, I've, I've heard all these in my years of help, trying to help people. You make excuses for their behavior by telling yourself that they've been through a lot. A trauma binds you together or there's feelings of pressure or control. Is this still okay, by the way, that I'm talking about these matters with y'all? I think this is important and healthy. Okay. We're getting there. Some folks, this is neat, okay? This is, I had to throw this in there. We're going to talk about being addicted to relationships, period. Some folks are flat out addicted to relationships. It is debated on whether or not that's actually possible. It's funny. The, the, the psychologists who say, no, you cannot be addicted to relationships, admit that people have addic addicted-like behaviors. They just don't think you can be addicted to something you have to have. It's like being addicted to water, addicted to air. And since they feel a human has to have contact, they don't believe you can be addicted to contact. But they cannot deny that there are addictive-like behaviors. 
So on that subject, I'm going to call it addicted to relationships just as a general term. Addiction, however, is a serious condition that affects the brain. True addiction makes it difficult to think about anything else. You're compelled to keep thinking that thing out, even when your need negatively affects you or your loved one. There, we've seen people who are addicted to drugs, and we can relate to that. We've seen people addicted to alcohol, we can relate to that. No matter what it does to, their, to themselves or their family, they go back to it. The same thing for people in their relationships, they go back to it. This description can make it easy to translate relationship behaviors into a relationship addiction. Some of their relationship addiction behaviors might include feeling incomplete without a partner, constantly talking about falling in love, having more interest in being in love than in sustaining a healthy relationship. People in love often experience euphoria, cravings, dependency, withdrawal, and other behaviors associated with addiction. This happens because the dopamine reward system in your brain is activated by romantic love just as it's activated by substances and addictive behaviors. However, researchers noted that the cravings and longings tend to mellow over time into a more stable, lasting love, that is, when the love is mutual. One-sided or unrequited love might feel more addictive. Signs to look for that you have a or another relationship addiction is the feel that you need to keep falling in love. You continue craving someone who doesn't feel the same way. You idolize the idea of love. What that means is with the, with the ideals in mind, you might feel like you have to keep searching for that soulmate, that perfect love, without considering the very real work that goes into making a relationship strong and successful. You don't care who you date just as long as you're in a relationship. Many people who struggle with compulsive relationships behaviors need others to build up their self-worth. If you find it hard to love yourself or make yourself happy, then you might look for someone to fulfill that need. Your relationship follows a similar pattern. You're always dating the same type of person with the same type of outcome. Some tips for overcoming it? You can try a reality check. See if, if you tend to idolize love. See if you're looking at your relationships as, a, as medicine for something else. Take a break from relationships. Practice loving yourself. Self-love is tied to self-esteem, and a lack of either can contribute to relationship dependency and addiction-like behaviors. Asking yourself if you have realistic standards for yourself. Well, that's important. Identifying negative self-talk. So that is the secular side of today's public service announcement. Now, I want to tie in to the spiritual. Now we're going to have biblical Sunday school about toxic relationships. I hope I'm not stepping on any toes in here today, by the way. I didn't have this with anyone in mind. Again, it was requested a month ago. Don't assume you know who requested it. It's probably not who you're thinking. Just saying. 1 Corinthians 15 and 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The English Standard Version says, Be not deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. That's a pretty good definition of toxic relationship. The King James Version of 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The English Standard Version of the same verse says, Be not deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Man, I can't stand... One thing, I never could understand why the kids would always hang out with thugs just because they tolerated it. And I asked them, why do you hang out with this person that's dragging in? Because it's the only friend I have. Then you die alone. That's what I always tell them. It's better to die alone than to go to hell with your friend. Because eventually, the Bible tells you 
bad company will ruin your good morals. Romans 16, starting at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Another translation from the English Standard Version, same verse, Romans 16, 17, 18. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. That's another good verse for toxic relationships. They talk that smooth talk. And all they're doing is counterproducting what you learn. And they're pulling you away. How can they do that? Maybe they're not making you smoke or drink or anything like that. By making you feel any less worth than what Jesus paid for is a sin. By making you feel like you deserve to be mistreated. He did not die on that cross for that. He, gave, he came so that you may have life and life more abundantly. And if they convince you you don't deserve that, then they are contradicting the doctrine. 1 Corinthians 13 and 4. We know this. I'm going to read it in King James and again in English Standard. I just like to compare different languages. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, seeketh, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Let me rephrase that with the English standard. And again, I want you to compare this to your relationship and see if it's a toxic one or a godly one. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Proverbs 22 and 24 to 25. Now. No, you weren't. You weren't clicking it. I tried to get your attention. Oh, sorry. Well, I wasn't. English Andrews not up, up there sliding, so I was not sliding. No, you didn't slide through the, any of the verses. Are you on that first Corinthians thirteen? It was said in the Thank you, daughter. No, don't support her. Don't encourage her to be right. All right, Proverbs twenty-two, twenty-four to twenty-five. Make no friendship with an angry man. And by the way, women, that goes to you too. Okay? And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. Hallelujah. Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. You thought I was making it up earlier. You thought I was being whiny when I said I don't like angry people. That's Bible. Man, oh, I wish I could slap some people with that scripture. Why are you with that person? Why did you date that person? Ah, ah. Yes. <laughs> he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. I'm pretty sure those are just a few verses, but you get the idea. There's Bible stories after Bible stories. You know, Jezebel was a toxic relationship. Amnon had a friend, that whole story, that wonderful message. Amnon had a friend that talked him into raping his half-sister. He wouldn't have done it had he not got talked into it. That was not by a girlfriend, that was by a friend, his cousin. And 
And let me tell you one thing. Love is no excuse. I don't care if you love the mistake. Now, if you're already married, you're already married. But if, if you're not married, listen up. Just because you spent a long time making a mistake, don't mean you got to keep on to it. Your friends that you love so much, I'm sorry that you hung out with the wrong crowd and now you fell in love with it. But the Bible tells you who you can and cannot hang out with. The Bible tells you that believers should not be unequally yoked with non-believers. If you went against the word of God and found yourself attached now to ungodly people, that's your fault for whatever happens. It's not like you tell the drug, the crackhead, oh, go ahead and continue smoking your crack because I know you love it. No, you tell the crackhead, get off the crack. Get help. Same thing for those who fall in love with toxic relationships. Exact same thing. I know it breaks your heart. I know it's sad. But you made your bed, now lie in it. And if you want help, it's going to take God to give you that help. And just maybe, you may have to repent for even putting yourself in those shoes to begin with. But he is willing and able to forgive. And he can reach down to any pit. The, the earth is his footstool. There is no pit that he cannot reach down into and pull you out of We just have to make good decisions. Everything really does matter. It matters who you talk to. Man, it matters who you hang out with. Because you never know what one thing will lead to another. And if you just had made a better decision to begin with, maybe you would have avoided a whole lot of heartache down the road. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns about today's Sunday School lesson?